I think I come to this panel as somewhat the outsider or the only person who doesn't work in, in film full time. Um, by trade, for the past 15 years, I am a designer of bespoke clothing with a boutique. So film, very much for me, has become a passion project. Um, in my practice as a designer, I have tended to kind of interact with, with film by the artists that I've worked with and for small television or film projects that I've worked with over the years. Um, but most significantly, in 2010, I had the opportunity to be part of an artist collective um, who and, and receive a grant from the Arts Council Act Cultural Leadership Project. Um, so I had this great opportunity to work with a, a group of really diverse black artists, uh, some of whom are here today, actually, Galen Gould, <laughs> two of your key keynote speakers, and, and Deborah Williams. Um, and it culminated in a group show at the Royal Society of Arts. Um, but it was as part of that that I really, my interest in film really crystallised. Um, and as, as that exhibition was finishing, as that period of development was finishing, um, we were, the London riots happened. And I was particularly affected by that because my business was looted and essentially gutted mm -hmm. during that period. Um, and so with my kind of revived interest in film and, and the experience and engagement that I personally had in, with, with media, with media outlets in terms of the projection of image, the dis discourse on culture, I was really interested in, in using that moment to, to kind of have a further ex exploration in cinema and television and the representation of culture and the discourse around representations of culture. Um, and so I had been working with the Black Cultural Archives um, as a volunteer, and, but there was a, an opportunity there to kind of see how I could program something around that aspect of representation and, and look at film and also explore the function of the archive and how the archive talks to contemporary culture. Um, and so I had been working in, in outreach externally with the Black Cultural Archives for a couple of years. And of course, that, if, is anyone, is everyone familiar with Black Cultural Archives? It's a heritage organization founded about 30 years ago, really by community activists and uh, by pure stealth managed to acquire this beautiful building uh, which sits in the heart of Brixton's Windrush Square, so a historic landmark site. Um, but they opened their Heritage Centre in 2014 um, and as part of the opening there was a great opportunity and outreach from the local neighbouring cinema, Ritzy Cinema, to, to see if we could do something collaboratively. So that was my first year as the external curator of Black Cultural Archives Film Festival. Um, the inspiration for that year really was legacy and the significance of, of what the Black Cultural Archives opening was going to represent within that space. And of course, amidst all the prevailing discussions about gentrification, space, dislocation, it was interesting to see what we could program around archival work um, and, and new work that could really feed into that discourse. Um, and so the first film festival took place in the summer of 2014 really inspired by, by the theme of legacy, and also the recent passing of uh, cultural theorist Stuart Hall, who had obviously been a huge influence in, in the discourse on culture, British culture and multiculturalism. Um, and so we opened with, with John O'Confra's The Stuart Hall Project, which was beautifully attended, and we would kind of curate Q&As around each of the films. And it was a really, really brief season put together in the blink of an eye. Um, but the inspiration for that really was, and, and by way of the project I'd done in, in 2010, um, the Legacy legacy Project, Legacy of Black British Filmmakers and, and where we were now with that kind of representation. Um, in particular, uh, one of my mentors during the, the Cultural Leadership Project phase was uh, film curator June Giovanni, who <laughs> I'm sure you know. <laughs> yeah. So she was the... Uh, See, I'm, I'm back. Okay, yeah. I'll, get there. I'll, say, I'll say it quickly. She was uh, she set up the uh, African Caribbean Film Unit at the BFI, the now defunct African Caribbean Film Unit, which is significant. Um, and uh, with Gaylene Gould there, co-founded the Black Film Bulletin magazine, which was just such a beautiful resource, which lasted for a couple of years, early 90s to mid 90s, and then also is now defunct. Moved to University of East London and kind of. So that's why legacy was such an important thing for me. What has become of all this kind of groundwork that's been done in terms of kind of trying to spark this discourse. So we, um, so that was an influencing factor in, in kind of curating the first round of the film festival. Um, then around the same time, things like uh, 
the Black London Film Heritage Project came up. Mm. So I think they launched at the BFI with Big City Stories. Mm -hmm. And so some of these really kind of precious films, small films that really you wouldn't see in cinemas and, you know, inaccessible to, to most audiences um, in terms of finding them, not the content. Um, so those were inspiration points. So we showed, for instance, uh, a 1963 film by Lloyd Record, lives in the BFI archive, called Ten Bob in Winter. And just looking at really interesting things, lesser seen representations of black culture, satire and, and humour and, and, you know, the intellect of, of black culture, things that often aren't prevalent in, in mainstream media representations of black culture. Um, so on to last year, no, this year's festival. This, year. <laughs> this year's festival, I'm not, I'm not moved this on. Year. <laughs> okay, on to this year's festival. Um, the BCA's second exhibition this year was Staying Power, so you can see. That's, that is the defining image of Staying Power. Staying Power was a two-site exhibition, photographic partnership, uh, called Staying Power Photographs of Black British Experience, 1950s to the 1990s. It launched in January of this year. Uh, it was a partnership, um, a long-term partnership between the V&A and Black Cultural Archives that lived at both sites. And so it represented such a great opportunity to curate a festival inspired by the images within this exhibition. Um, and the exhibition derives its name from Peter Fryer's 94, 80, 1984 book, Staying Power, The History of Black People in Britain. Um, and Peter Fryer had worked as a journalist and he'd covered, in 1948, the Empire Windrush arrival at Tilbury Docks. And that, that was quite prevalent in, in, in inspiring the, the curation of that exhibition. So I'd spend a lot of time just looking at the image, absorbing them and working out how to kind of take some of the political moments from those pictures and what kind of content would speak best towards that. Um, working with, and I'll point her out here, uh, Head of Marketing at the BCA, Monique Baptiste Brown, she's at the back there. So she was my co-collaborator, -co co-conspirator in this. Um, and we had obviously continued our partnership with Ritzy, Ritzy Marketing, and also with assistance from Picture House Acquisitions, who were principally responsible for acquiring the film. So on that end, they spared us that. Um, what should I say? What should I say? Um, so the overall, just to tell you the synopsis for this film festival, uh, trying to define it and trying to talk about such a large body of work, uh, if essentially came up with the tagline, a salute to the pioneering voices of black British cinema, those independent storytellers, community griots, radical documentarians and counterculture moving image activists who animate the unseen and amplify the seldom explored narratives. <coughs> so that was the essence of, of Staying Power. The festival was curated in six chapters. Um, essentially, you can, you can view the festival as a, a work of diversity, an example, a case study for diversity, but we just found that the festival itself said it, it didn't really need that banner because we were interested in exploring specific themes, because we were interested in the human question and the universal question. And so I had kind of divided the festival into six chapters. A question of belonging, which really talked about the histories of migration and the evolving understanding of identities, intersections on race, gender, class, disability, sexuality, um, love, love with a deliberate question mark, really to kind of talk about the monolith of representation of black culture, whether love has been expressed enough, interrogated enough, explored enough, what does love look like, what is love um, as an expression of black film and television culture. Um, black Genius uh, was the third chapter, Revolt and Revolution. Um, black Genius, just to, to talk about that, celebration of the contributions of black culture to British society. Um, revolt and Revolution. Um, Black history, black British history, general diaspora history is, has been so marked by a narrative of resistance or uprisings. So it was really difficult to, to think of the festival and to think of the images within Staying Power without referencing them in some way. But also the language for that became very important because riot is the easy go-to and it tends to kind of oversimplify what has happened. So I, I'm interested in looking at the language of resistance, revolution, and also kind of the intellect behind some of the movements that had, had preceded these uprisings. Um, the fourth chapter was Soul Cinema, Mirroring the Black Atlantic. It was the last chapter to be added, though the fourth chapter because, oh sorry, the fifth chapter, because the Staying Power exhibition was really about a black British experience. But in looking at the images, and for instance, this image that you're looking, now, looking at now, 
obviously the ban of black power, the associations are very much US associations. You think of the Black Panther Party movement period of the late 60s and that kind of period of, of socio-political revolution, um, which kind of has roots here. So uh, it, it was about the idea of these migrations and the connections between the diaspora. And so it became very difficult to think of the festival without having somewhat of a chapter on identities within the diaspora. So that was kind of dedicated <coughs> to soul cinema mirroring the Black Atlantic. And it allowed us to reference work, for instance, like uh, 1995 Panther, uh, Mario Van Peebles' biopic, which talked about the Black Panther movement. Um, but also in terms of thinking about how, how what was happening socio-politically now, and social media, grassroots initiatives like the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. so it allowed us to kind of tie different time periods <coughs> together, or explore the, the, the genesis from one stage to another. Um, and the last chapter was Black in the Digital Age which was a really good way to kind of have a conversation about new media, Afrofuturist aesthetics, and the role of the grassroots artist collective in kind of defining new identities. Um, 16 films were programmed in all. Uh, we had some really good partners, uh, co-presentation partners, Film4 Online, uh, who partnered with us on presenting uh, a film by, the launch <laughs> film by playwright Debbie Tucker Green, Second Coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, which disconcertingly wasn't going to have a broad cinematic release. So we kind of happened at the right time and a convergence and some really interesting things and also campaigns that were becoming quite public about, and I'm looking at Simran here, about films that were had audiences, had proved their audiences, yet which weren't receiving UK cinematic releases, Dear White People being one of them. And so there was this really good opportunity to kind of capture some of these things uh, in order to feed them into conversations around the festival. Um, outside of the 16 films, uh, I don't know how I'm doing for time, so I was going uh, to... you got about five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Um, <laughs> to be fair, yeah. say to all five Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay um, just, okay, just a quick overview of the films that we had. The films were divided, obviously, into the six chapters. In a question of belonging, we started in... The timeline for the film festival was 1959 to 2015, so pretty pretty broad, but capturing the era that the photographs were part of. Um, we began with BAFTA award-winning film Sapphire from 1959, which is quite a landmark Great. film in discussing race in, in Britain. Um, also in that chapter was Black <coughs> Joy, which was a, a can entry in 1977, but which I'd only come to quite late, so kind of an irreverent film interesting film. Um, Territories, uh, Isaac Julian's Territories, 1984, Shoot the Messenger, Ngozi and Wura, uh, one of the sadly few female filmmakers that we managed to get in this festival, and it was quite complicated in terms of obtaining, obtaining some of the more seemingly obscure prints that some of these filmmakers had, and, and hers was one of them. We actually didn't get to show that film, though it was programmed, because we couldn't obtain the print. In Love, with a question mark, uh, we had a beautiful film from 1966, Jemima and Johnny. It's a short film that lives uh, in the BFI archive by a South African filmmaker who had moved, who was exiled to Britain during the South African apartheid era. Um, Second Coming, as I mentioned, 2015, Debbie Tucker Green. Uh, burning in a, a double bill, within the love theme from uh, Menelik Shabazz, who's one of those kind of pioneering filmmakers who emerged from the black film filmmaker workshop collectives in the 1980s when those workshops were actually had some government support and some funding. Um, so it was important for me to again bring in the work of the, the film workshop collectives. To, yeah. yeah, and also to, to kind of get to show their contemporary work alongside some of their, their early work. Um, in Black Genius, we had um, Twilight City by Riesel Geist, also a member of um, the filmmaker workshops, Black Audio Film Collective. So um, worked collaboratively with John O'Confra, who probably is the most prominent of Black Audio Film Collective. Um, we showed John O'Confra's Last Angel of History. Uh, and also a, a film about aesthetic culture, The Fade, uh, a more than 2012 film by filmmaker Andy Mundy Castle. Um, Revolt and Revolution, we showed another film by Menelik Shabazz, 81 film detailing the, the New Cross Riots era. Um, Blood of Goran was the uh, title of the film, and also we showed John O'Confra's Handsworth Songs from 1986. Um, two films which are really rare films, really contextualised. There, there isn't much work by black filmmakers about that particular type, but I think they, those are 
probably the most prominent of the films that capture specific moments of uprising. Um, and then in Soul Cinema, mirroring the Black Atlantic, uh, we showed Panther from 1995, Mari Van Peebles' film. Uh, a film, an interesting film about romance and gentrification, uh, Barry Jenkins' uh, Medicine for Melancholy, and, uh, and of course, 2014's Dear White People, much talked of Dear White People. Um, the salons were a real high point in, in this year's festival. We didn't have those for the first year. Um, as opposed to really investing the time in the Q&As, after post-screening Q&As, we wanted to kind of just give the audience, give the attendees two, two themes to discuss as they wanted, and also to pick which films they felt reflected that. So what we found was that it, it, it was brilliant in terms of turnout. The, the salon sold out much quicker than the films, which was wow. really interesting. So people went to talk and not watch. People really did. People really did. Really did. And it, it was really, I think, really valuable for, for feedback for the Black Cultural Archives, and especially for me as an external person, in terms of kind of getting a sense of what that local, or what these local communities want to talk about and what historically yeah. we need to revive and kind of contextualize. Um, so we had a really great selection of speakers. I was really inspired by, I don't know if anyone has seen Sundance's, Sundance Channel's Iconoclast series, whereby they get two people from completely different walks of life to sit down and talk about different cultural moments and kind of to, to feed off one another. But that was the idea in thinking. I was really interested in, in the idea of provocations, but purposeful provocations. So we had some people who were academics, artists, writers, filmmakers, art historians, curators. So um, Michael Riley, who's really a pioneering musician, uh, founder of Steel Pulse and the Reggae Philharmonic Orchestra. Akala, who is, is very infamous, I suppose, as a cultural commentator and a musician. Um, urban, theorist professor, urban theorist Professor Paul Goodwin, who's the head of Black, black Art and Design at the University of Arts London. Uh, we borrowed one of Tate's curators, Zoe Whitley, who's brilliant, and she's curating a season right now on um, Sankofa, uh, Rewind Sankofa, so it's a really interesting retrospective of the work of one of the film workshops, Sankofa. Um, and Dion Walker was one of our filmmakers, and she's significant for various reasons, but has her film, The Hard Stop, which poignantly looks at the 2011 riots and the situation around Mark, the Mark Duggan case. Um, and her film has been picked up for Toronto International Film Festival and BFI LFF this season. You've got that a minute. A minute, OK. <laughs> um, OK, so just a, a last thing. Interesting reactions to our poster that we ran with. This was kind of a choice to pick the most provocative but also the most arresting of the images. It was interesting to have it outside the cinema and to see how people would respond to it, whether they'd kind of feel put off. It's kind of an audience tester, but we were really interested in, in, in arousing curious minds for this, for this festival, so that explains the choice of this particular poster. Um, the marketing for the festival was principally done via social media. Semi-targeted campaigns, I mean, really talking about the conversations that were happening <coughs> gave us a gold mine to, to choose from to kind of contextualize our festival um, and yeah those, the feedback was really that this needs more support this needs to travel we want more of this and you got lots of people yeah and yeah. were they people that normally go to the Ritzy or that don't normally go to the Ritzy it's hard to tell I think a lot of people depending on where they got the information from uh -huh. those who kind of found out via Black Cultural Archives would be patrons and they'd just be interested in kind of supporting and then you'd have people who were kind of like wandering in and then you always get the curious people yeah. who just want to see something that doesn't usually live there yeah. so what was interesting for us is that we, we wouldn't mark it as BAME because yeah. we don't have to it's Black Cultural Archives yeah. it already has its we were interested in the themes yeah. and, but obviously maybe that serves a different function for Picture House and, and mm -hmm. Ritzy um, so it kind of was a convergence of different interests. So it was a little bit experimental, but it was yeah, oh, it was right. well received. Uh, well great. received. Right. Thank you very much. You're